that if you're really earnest, if you're really sincere, if you're serious, aspirant on the path towards self-discovery, you can create your own temple in your home. You can create your own uh, area where meditation becomes that cornerstone of your life. And welcome back to the Meditation and Mindfulness Podcast. I'm Rob Zaremba, and I've got a special treat for you this week. It's our third podcast, and I wanted to bring some light to an ancient text that I feel is extremely important for understanding meditation, mindfulness, and the full process of yoga. Now, the word yoga has been misunderstood largely in the West as merely the physical exercise, going to yoga class and um, you know learning the postures. But the word yoga that I'm referring to and the, the text that we'll be reading from today, uh, the word yoga actually means to join, to merge, or to yoke, to join the individual mind with the mind of the divine. This is the true meaning of yoga. So the text that I'd like to share with you today is called the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali is an ancient text that's been translated by many different authors and translators over time. And I think it's a great foundation for the practice of meditation. The understandings and the teachings within these Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are very uh, instructive as to the proper way to go about this process of yoga, meditation, mindfulness, um, specifically uh, relating to all sorts of um, uh, approaches, methods, techniques, ways of living, explanations. And so I think it's a good foundational text for everybody to read. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of do a... Uh, a reading from it today. Um, this might be kind of a longer podcast, but I'll try to uh, fit as much as I can in. And if I have to do it in two parts, then I'll do it in two parts just to keep it under an hour per podcast here. So, so who was Patanjali? Now, this is I'm reading from a uh, a downloadable version. If you just go to Google and type in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and it's spelled P A T A N. J-A-L-I, Patanjali. Um, you can find all sorts of books that you can buy on Amazon, or this is just a downloadable PDF that I found with a pretty simple translation. So Patanjali was this mysterious yogi who lived thousands of years ago. Um, we're not really too sure about him, um, but they say he lived in India between 400 B.C. and 300 A.D., um, and he's the author of these Yoga Sutras. And let's just jump right into the text. So the word sutra is, it means translated into thread. It gives the barest idea of meaning. So the sutras were kind of like teachings. Um, so the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. Chapter 1, The Aims of Yoga. And remember, when I refer to the word yoga, I'm referring to a system of self-discovery. A system which is more of a science. You could call it the science of self-discovery, liberation, enlightenment. Okay, so the first four sutras. And now, the teaching of yoga begins. We need to study and practice. Yoga is the progressive settling of the mind into silence. Mental control and illusion is in the mind. And I'll also kind of provide a little bit of commentary here and there. When the mind is settled, we are established in our essential state, which is unbounded consciousness. Self-realization. The knower of all reality. Our essential nature is usually overshadowed by the activity of the mind. Our daily activity usually keeps us in delusion and suffering. 
uh, the five types of mental activity which may or may not cause suffering, selfish thoughts with motivation or unselfish with no motivation. So these are understanding, knowledge from direct experience or reliable source, misunderstanding, delusion from a false impression of reality, imagination, thoughts without substance, jumping to conclusions, sleep, the thought of having no thought, memory, returning to past experiences. Patanjali tells us that they can all be settled with yoga and the freedom it gives. Patanjali tells us that we have to be committed and consistent over a long period of time. Uh, and this, this is absolutely true. As you guys know, that's what I preach all the time. Freedom is that triumphant state of consciousness that is beyond the influence of desire. Practice detachment from personal desires. Even the desire to know God is a form of bondage. Patanjali talks about the different levels of samadhi. A samadhi has four levels. In Salvakalpal Samadhi, we gain knowledge of power. And Samadhi, by the way, is the height of meditation. It's the stage that you reach in meditation after um, much practice where you can actually still the mind and enter into the stages of samadhi. So this is describing the different stages. Salvakalpal samadhi is we gain knowledge and power of physical objects. We understand the abstract nature of things beyond objects. Only awareness of bliss. Only the sattvic ego, the I-ness, remains. So the sattvic ego is, I guess, the purest form of any type of self that's left. It's the most refined, last drop of any sort of ego. And when we're talking about ego in this sense, we're talking about just a sense of separate self. Next, nervacopal samadhi is one with the soul, no mind, only infinite peace and bliss. The heart feels bigger than the universe. The state comes and goes. So nervacopal samadhi is um, an even deeper experience that is beyond experience, beyond the level of knower, but it's, it's not permanent. It's, it's, it's a glimpse beyond the self into enlightenment. Some could even call it the experience of realization itself, but it's not lasting. It hasn't yet become one's permanent state of being. And then you have Sahaja Samadhi, the highest Samadhi. The constant experience of samadhi, nervacopal samadhi, along with daily activity. Nothing detracts from wholeness and perfection. So this would be a fully enlightened being is always in a state of sahaja samadhi. Continuing on, Patanjali describes Brahman, free from the cause and effects of action, beyond time, finest knowledge. He is expressed through the sound of the sacred syllable Om, and should be repeated and its essence revitalized. The entire creation manifests from the sound om, the cosmic hum. 1.3 The obstacles to progress. Illness creates fatigue. Fatigue leads to doubt. Doubts cause carelessness and laziness. Laziness brings sensory attachment. Attachment manifests delusion. Delusion is the obstacle to achieving and maintaining samadhi and creates suffering. So you can see how this is a cycle. And as I, as I talk about meditation, the height of meditation, meditation is a state of being. Meditation is samadhi. At, at the heights of meditation, samadhi is the state. So... That is our natural state, this state of consciousness, undiluted. But the cycle of illness creating fatigue, and by illness it doesn't necessarily mean being sick, although 
this is a rough translation. When you say illness, it could just mean dis-ease, as in anything that comes up in life where it's not, where it's um, some form of, well, I guess illness is uh, a way of just saying not, in alignment, when you're not in alignment with your truth, that is a form of dis-ease. It's a form of um, incongruity. So, illness creates fatigue. Fatigue leads to doubt. Doubt causes carelessness and laziness. Laziness brings sensory attachment. Attachment manifests delusion, and delusion is the obstacle to achieving and maintaining samadhi and creates suffering. The practice of yoga is like an obstacle course. The mind becomes clear and serene with the following. Cultivating the qualities of the heart, friendliness toward the joyful, compassion towards the suffering, happiness towards the pure, impartiality towards the impure. Various breathing exercises are included. Experience of, experiences of finer levels of the senses, the higher senses. Experience of the inner radiance, free from sorrow. Being attuned to another mind, unperturbed by desire. Witnessing sleep and dreaming. Any meditation that is held in esteem. So these are all ways in which the mind can become clear and serene. Patanjali goes on to talk about samadhi, or mental absorption. Samadhi is... I'm going to probably pronounce this incorrectly, Ritambara, Ritambara, where consciousness perceives only truth. Ritambara is the realization of truth. We can only access by going beyond the mind. Chapter 2, The Practice of Yoga. Patanjali starts with the essence of the chapter, purification, refinement, surrender. These are the practical steps on the path to yoga. Purity of body, mind, and speech. Refinement, study of the scriptures, meditation, surrender, karma yoga. The causes of suffering are five. Ignorance of our true nature. Failure to discriminate between the pure and impure. Egoism, the limiting sense of I. Attachment, the clinging to pleasure. Aversion, the clinging to pain. The fear of death, the clinging to life. Ignorance of our true nature is the source of the other four. The gross effects of suffering are discarded through meditation. Karma. The impressions of past actions stored deep within the mind are the seeds of desire. They ripen into action in seen and unseen ways, if not in this life, then in the next. Every action has a reaction. The fruit of wrong action is sorrow. The fruit of right action is joy. Take responsibility. But the suffering yet to come should be averted. Make conscious choices. The self is obscured by the world in order that the reality of both might be discovered. It is ignorance of our real nature that is the cause that causes the self to be obscured. When ignorance is destroyed, the self is liberated from its identification with the world. This liberation is enlightenment. Ignorance is destroyed by the undisturbed discrimination between self and the world. There are seven stages in this growth to wisdom. Realization that our spiritual source is within us, loss of external desires. The cessation of suffering, ending of ignorance of the true self, as all suffering is in the mind. Taste of samadhi, transcending thought, pure potential, pure knowledge, integrating pure consciousness into activity, cosmic consciousness. No more need for mental activity and the external world, the mind, becomes simple and humble. 
memories and karma are released. The mind is dissolved. Full experience of samadhi, which is never lost. These are revealed by the light of pure knowledge when the nervous system has been purified by the practice of yoga. Moving on to the eight limbs of yoga. Patanjali describes, and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing any of these, Patanjali describes yama, niyama, asanya, pranayama, and pratyahara. Yama, the codes of moral and social conduct, correct social behavior, a harmonious relationship with all. Number one, non-violence to all living things. Number two, truthfulness, and I'll kind of move through these. Number three, non-stealing. Number four, celibacy, or not wasting energy. Number five, abstaining from greed. Next, niyama, the principles for living our own lives, process of purification, the duties and obligations for a spiritual life. Number one, purity and the purification of not only the body, but the mind and the emotions. Number two, contentment. Number three, tapas, or austerities. Number four, the study, who am I? Number five, devotion. Next are asana, the posture. And when I'm reading through these, I see that they all apply to the practice of meditation. You must be pure in order to get the best experience from meditation. And you must have the proper posture to get the best experience from meditation. So asanya posture and asanya also refers to yoga, yoga postures. Next you have pranayama. Pranayama is the mastering of the breath. And then you have Pratyahara, turning the senses inward to explore the inner universe. Next, you have chapter 3, the yogic powers. Patanjali completes the eight limbs of yoga. Dharana, Dhyana, and Samadhi. And I think these in particular relate directly to the meditation practice. And forgive me again if I'm mispronouncing any of these, but uh, I'll just do my best. Dharana is effortless focused attention, training the mind to meditate. This is the concentration. When the attention is held focused on an object, this is known as dharana. Next, dhyana. The continuous flow, meditation perfected. So this is meditation. This is the true meaning of meditation. The continuous flow, meditation perfected. When awareness flows evenly toward the point of attention, this is known as dhyana. And next, the next stage, the most advanced stage within meditation, samadhi, lost, found in the divine, the final liberation. And we des described the stages of samadhi earlier. He goes into more emphasis that dharana, dhyana, and samadhi practiced together are known as sanyama. Now, by delving deep into an object, we can release its secrets and the yogic powers. Siddhis are revealed, or siddhas. When samyama is mastered, all three aspects of meditation, dhyana, or dharana, dhyana, and samadhi is mastered. The light of supreme knowledge dawns. The hidden truth of an object, its laws of nature, is understood. But sanyama has its application at every stage of the development of this knowledge. Practice is accomplished in stages. Master one before attempting the next. And uh, I must paraphrase, this is definitely why I emphasize mastering your concentration ability using the single-pointed mind techniques to gain uh, 
a certain degree of concentration ability before we go into other stages of the meditation practice. It is in the heart of yoga, more intimate than the preceding limits. The last three limbs are inward, mental practices, whereas the first five involve the world and act as a preparation. Yet, sanyama, the meditation practice, is outside that pure unboundedness. Even sanyama is gross compared to the pure consciousness. It is a lower form of samadhi. Patanjali tells us that the world may change due to time and conditions. But the yogi, everything remains the same. And he, she develops dispassion to the world. And this is where a sense of renunciation must occur. Even if you're not uh, a monk and that renunciates the world to go live in a monastery, you can still be somewhat of a renunciate and spend your time wisely meditating every day, reading spiritual books, spending time around others that are also on the spiritual path. This is a form of modern renunciation. I don't think anyone in the modern world needs to go become a monk or in a monastery, unless that's something that you want to do. But you can kind of create your own monastery and become your own monk. There's enough teachings in the world. There's enough guides. There's enough you know, uh, information out there that if you're really earnest, if you're really sincere, if you're serious, aspirant on the path towards self-discovery, you can create your own temple in your home. You can create your own uh, area where meditation becomes that cornerstone of your life. And renunciation simply means that you don't always go out and trash your energy in the world by going out to the myriad of ways that you can trash your energy in the world so it's 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 a conservative life and but the practice of renunciation is interesting because when it comes time to seriously get down to business and what i mean by that is when you sit down to meditate and the rubber hits the road the shit hits the fan and whatever comes up is going to come up and our goal is to practice that meditation for that 20, 30, 40, 50 minute period, whatever it might be, five minute period, then renunciation is absolutely imperative to have a successful meditation session. What do I mean by that? At that moment that you sit down to meditate, you need to forget about the world, forget about yourself, forget about what's going to happen later, what happened earlier, and that is the true form of renunciation. It's a moment-to-moment practice, and this can lead to your mindfulness practice throughout the day. If we're constantly thinking about the world, if we're constantly worried about the world or what the world's consequences might be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, of course, you can be concerned with a compassion if that's something that motivates you. If you want to help people and help the world, that's definitely... Um, a good karmic practice, I would say. And you can absolutely help a lot of people by going out actively and helping the world in a lot of ways. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes time to sit down and meditate, the goal is clear. And it's to clear the mind. And the only way to clear the mind is by absolutely, absolutely forgetting about everything else except the task at hand. So let's get back to the task at hand and... Patanjali describes the yogic powers, or siddhas, which can come from practice. Patanjali regards these powers as the greatest stumbling block to our spiritual progress. So, he goes on to say that this practice of sanyama, which is dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, the meditation practice, on the form of the body, makes it and this, is, this goes into the, what are called the siddhas, or the powers, that can be developed from meditation. So meditation on the form of the body makes it imperceptible by breaking the contact between the eye of the observer and the light reflected by the body. Well, that would be a neat trick. Invisibility, right? The fruits of action may return to the doer quickly or slowly from this practice of meditation, and I'm paraphrasing from the word sanyama, the practice of meditation on the fruit of action comes foreknowledge of the time of death and the understanding of omens. 
This is another siddha that can be developed, uh, the understanding of the effects of one's karma. The practice of meditation on friendliness, compassion, and happiness, these qualities blossom from the practice of meditation on the strength of an elephant or other creatures, we gain that strength. From the practice of meditation on the sun comes knowledge of the various realms of the universe or the cosmos. From meditation on the moon comes knowledge of the arrangement of the stars. From the meditation on the pole star comes knowledge of their motion. Meditation on the navel center brings knowledge of the bodily system. Meditation on the hollow in the throat brings the cessation of hunger and thirst. Meditation on the kerma nerve in the trachea brings steadiness. I'm not sure what the kerma nerve is. I wonder if that's inter um, parallel with the var vargas. From meditation on the light in the head, we see the perfected ones. By the clarity of intuitive perception, everything can be known. Through a life of purity, enlightenment comes spontaneously and gives us all the powers. From meditation on the heart comes an awareness of pure mind. We can know the contents of the mind. From meditation on inner fulfillment brings knowledge of the self. From this knowledge are born intuitive clarity, finest hearing, touch, sight, taste, and smell. And you can definitely uh, get a sense of this, paraphrasing here, that meditation practice makes you a more pure vessel, clear, with bringing more clarity. Every action that you do takes on a greater clarity. And if you've meditated for a little while, you know this experience after meditation. Your thoughts become clear. Your, the environment seems to take on a clarity. That's, um, your perception seems to be more clear, etc. And um, you could just imagine what years of intense meditation can bring. And he's describing that these yogis attained these powers. Patanjali goes on to warn that these super physical sen supra super physical senses, when used for worldly pursuits, are obstacles to higher samadhi. So there's the warning, folks. If you use any of the powers that you gain from meditation in worldly pursuits, and what worldly pursuits I think really mean is selfish pursuits is what that really in my opinion paraphrases to if you use it for selfless helping helping people um, motivating people to meditate or take on a spiritual path and that is the opposite of what you know that that would not be included in the warning using your meditation powers for um, for good is always encouraged. Continuing on, when attachment to the body is loosened and there is perfect knowledge of the movement of the mind, the ability to enter another another's body is gained. On mastery of udana, the life breath that arises through the body, I guess that's another word for chi, energy. We can direct it upward and avoid contact with such things as water, mud, and thorns. Well, there's the magical, mystical walking on water power described as part of the siddhas. And next, from meditating on the relationship between body and akasha, together with the absorption and the lightness of cotton fiber, we can move through the air at will. Well, there he's describing flying or levitation. Patanjali talks about gaining mastery over the elements and the senses and mastery over nature so that nothing remains unknown. And when, when they are unattached, no interest in powers, even to this state, the very seeds of bondage are destroyed and enlightenment follows. So don't be tempted by those powers, folks. The powers may come, the powers may go, and that's all fine and good. But if that's your desire, then it's an easy trap on the pathway to enlightenment, on the pathway to freedom. So moving on, what is freedom? What is enlightenment? Patanjali tells us that some may be born enlightened and experiences can be through things such as drugs, but meditation and samadhi are the natural way. Our spiritual growth 
is always due to unfolding of Brahman, and although teachers can help you clear the way, no one can do it for you. Karma. Karma is only washed by spiritual realization. Karma can be good, bad, or mixed, but the enlightened are beyond karma. Our actions create memories and desires which give rise to karma, which determines the type of birth we have, regardless of where and when the action took place. Creation and dissolution are eternal, so karma has always been. Karma is rooted in ignorance, and we move in and out of its grip. The gunas. Past and future exist within an object due to the different characteristics of the object. Manifest characteristics are the present, unmanifest the past and future. Let me reread that. <clears throat> Manifest characteristics are the present. Unmanifest characteristics are the past and the future. All are workings of the gunas. The state of an object at any moment arises from the unique state of the gunas then operating. The same soul exists throughout all our incarnations with different forms and expressions due to the mix of gunas determined by karma. So these are the gunas. Co-creation. Two similar objects appear different because of the difference in the minds that perceive them. An object does not depend on a single mind for its existence. For if it did, what would become of it when it's not perceived by that mind? Well, that sounds very similar to the what if a tree falls in the forest type of situation. Witness. An object is only experienced when it colors the mind. How we see things is based on our level of consciousness. Ah, the color of consciousness. I like that. The mind itself is always experienced because it's witnessed by the unchanging self. Self is the constant witness of all. And this is a capital self, folks. Capital S, self, meaning the one, the self. Excuse me. Brahman witnesses Atman, Jiva, ego, mind, intellect, body, world. So it goes in that level. Brahman witnesses Atman, witnesses Jiva, witnesses ego, witnesses mind, intellect, which witnesses the body and the world. So there's a, I don't want to use the word hierarchy, but there's a, uh, a relational, central, you could almost look at it like a onion. It's been described like a, an onion or, um, you know, those, those dolls that are in, in the shells, um, nesting dolls, where there's a center of it all. And then there's an outer layer, an outer layer, an outer layer. And as the layers are further or farther away from the center, they become more illusory, if you will. And so it's the center that's perceiving it all. But we experience through these various layers, or we're, we're identified, let's say, through these various layers. Which layer are you identified with? Okay, next up, the self and mind. The mind does not shine by its own light. It, too, is an object illuminated by the self, capital S, self. Not being self-luminous, the mind cannot be aware of its object and itself at the same time. The mind, like everything else, is an object in, rela in relation to self. Only self is aware of everything at the same time. It is never the object. Let me read that again. Only self, capital S, self, as in the transcendental self, the one. Only self is aware of everything at the same time. It is never the object. Meditate on that. The mind perceives outside objects, or it can turn inwards to reflect the self, but not both at the same time. Interesting. So the mind is like a mirror. The mind perceives outside objects, or 
It can turn inwards to reflect the self, but not both at the same time. So you can see the limitations of mind. What I think of when I hear this description is like a movie projector. And the self, the transcendental self, is the light, the light bulb that shines, that is the illuminating factor that shines through all these layers. And mind just being a layer of the projector, right? but the mind is... Is, is the film. The film is, is literally like the thoughts in the mind, the filters that are projected. And I guess the mind is, is almost the entire thing in that the mind perceives the image that's projected from the light through the film and is projected onto the screen of the mind. So the mind is kind of like the container you know, when you say what's in the mind, the mind is, is just a container. But the mind can be full. The mind can be a mess. The mind can be like an out of shape, lazy body that is not, that does not perceive clearly. And therefore, the practice of meditation. And we're winding down here, folks. And I'm surprised we're getting through this whole thing. Uh, discrimination. Okay, all confusion about the nature of vanishes for one who has seen glory. Then, truly the mind begins to experience the transcendental self as separate from activity and is naturally drawn toward enlightenment. All thoughts that arise to interpret this discrimination are born of the latent impressions that still exist. These are to be destroyed by the same means as was described for the cause of suffering, Medif meditation, purification, refinement, surrender. Next, Jivan Mukti, one who has attained complete discrimination between the subtlest mind and the self, the transcendental self, has no... Uh, has no level of higher knowledge to acquire. This is Dharma Mega Samadhi, the state of unclouded truth, cloud, cl cloud of virtue, the highest Samadhi. All beautiful qualities are there. Sounds pretty good. All desires, even the desire to know God, have gone. It destroys the cause of suffering, and the bondage of action disappears. All that affects the mind is gone. All karma, except this lifetime, is dissolved. So, transcending the gunas, knowledge that has been freed from the veils of impurity is unbounded. Whatever can be known is insignificant in its light. This samadhi completes the transformations of the gunas and fulfills the purpose, purpose of evolution. The play of the gunas tortures the soul until it gives up and renounces the world. I think we all can experience can have a certain level of experience at this where the world just doesn't attract us any longer or maybe it does for a short time and then we always realize again that it, there's nothing in the world that's worth suffering for and as hard as it is sometimes for us to let things go we all kind of have a sense that in the end it's what we need to do. Now the process by which evolution unfolds through time is understood. Past, present, and future. All becomes now. Enlightenment. The gunas, their purpose fulfilled, return to their original state of harmony and pure unbounded consciousness remains forever established in its own absolute nature. This is enlightenment. And this is the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. I hope you enjoyed it, folks, and I hope you got something out of it. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you in the next podcast where 
In the next couple podcasts upcoming, I hope to do some interviews with some meditation teachers, and it should be some interesting stuff. And if you guys have any uh, topics that you're interested in me talking about here on the podcast, you can contact me on Facebook, Rob Zaremba, it's R-O-B-Z-A-R-E-M-B-A, Rob Zaremba on Facebook, or find the Meditation and Mindfulness Facebook group. It's just called Meditation and Mindfulness. Feel free to join the group if you're interested in more information about meditation and mindfulness practices. So we'll see you guys in the next podcast. Have a good one. Take care.